Okay. I don't know which way it is. I just have to keep pushing and talking until I get there. <laughs> well, uh, we do come to our last session, and we're a long ways from coming to the end of Galatians. So uh, let me just jump quickly into uh, some things. Uh, I, I remarked this morning at one point as uh, Maudine and I were <coughs> sitting at a <coughs> quietly in our uh, room that uh, one of the fascinations for me uh, with the Apostle Paul is that, uh, and, and probably it's a sign of, 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 of brilliance, uh, uh, people that I know that I consider to be truly brilliant to have this characteristic is is the rapidity with which their minds work. When when they're on something and something else comes to mind and the next thing comes to mind, and you can just watch this train of vigorous thought carrying along. And this happens to Paul from time to time, and it surely does in Galatians. We were noting yesterday that the issue, although it is set up in the speech to Peter as a contrast between faith in Christ Jesus and works of the law, <clears throat> that, and that's, and that's the, the genuine contrast. I don't mean to, to disregard that. He's going to constantly bring us back to faith in Christ Jesus. But in the process of all of this, the fascinating thing for me is that <clears throat> the contrast moves from faith in Christ Jesus to works of law to the work of the Spirit and the law. And the reason for that is quite simple. Uh, it is faith in Christ Jesus that has brought us into Christian life, which is evidenced by the Spirit. But what's going to happen is that the Spirit is going to be God's sufficiency for why we don't need the law. There is always this fear that people have if one does away with the law, that makes people lawless. Well, it does, praise God, but not in the second sense of lawless. Uh, and there's always this deep concern. You, and you know that Paul is always wrestling with this. Uh, you can tell it, for example, in 1 Corinthians uh, 9 when he says, I become all things to all people, that by all means I might win some. With those, when I'm, with, with those who are under the law, I'm as one under the law, although not myself under the law. You know, I live as one uh, in that moment. He says, those without the law, I live as without the law. But not lawless. <laughs> you know, just, you just instinctively recognize that he, 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 he can see that how easily people can jump on this. You become lawless if you don't have law. Well, the answer to that question is now going to be picked up in the later part of the argument, <clears throat> which we'll get to at the, at the latter part of our hour, where the spirit becomes the sufficiency for both life over against the flesh and for the reason the law is powerless to deal with the flesh. The spirit deals with both. It replaces law and is the effective agent to deal with the flesh. So that the spirit becomes the key to, <clears throat> to the life of the believer in the argument of Galatians. Now, in order to get there, let's watch for a moment how Paul's uh, uh, mind is working. In this earlier part of chapter 3, where we were yesterday, he uh, is dealing with the, these two kinds of existence. Those who rely on faith in Christ Jesus and those who rely on doing law. And then in that marvelous uh, uh, paragraph 10 to 14 <clears throat> indicates that, that these are two possible, these are two kinds of existence that are absolutely incompatible. And Christ came to remove the curse of having to live under law so that we can indeed live by faith in Christ Jesus. And the answer to this is receiving the promise of the Spirit. Well, after then taking up the questions of is the, are the promise and the law, 
opposed to one another. Paul says, absolutely not. They simply function differently. But the one thing that is absolutely certain is that the law does not do away with the promise. The promise was before the law, and it's fulfilled in Christ. <clears throat> so the, <clears throat> excuse me, early in the morning. <clears throat> Sorry about that. The law has this limited time. <clears throat> it wasn't intended for all time. It was intended as uh, God's uh, superintending agency uh, to, <clears throat> to keep people from, if you will, running amok uh, until the time of uh, faith <clears throat> in Christ Jesus should come. <clears throat> so in this argument, uh, now in chapter 3, uh, picking it up at verse uh, 23, Paul says, before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law. Now, that, <clears throat> that is the metaphor there, is the metaphor of imprisonment. And, and very frankly, Paul doesn't like that metaphor at all. It, it's the wrong metaphor for what he wants. So he moves from held in custody under the law, uh, locked up until the faith that was to come should be revealed. <clears throat> so he now is going to elaborate and put this under a different metaphor. So the law, <clears throat> the NIV now uh, translates, was put in charge of us, which is precisely the meaning of the metaphor, but it does eliminate the metaphor more precisely. The Greek word here is uh, pedagogus. It's the, it's the slave, the, the trusted slave in the Greco-Roman household who was entrusted with the care, especially of the heir, of that oldest son who was going to become the heir of all of the estate. And the pedagogue was, was the one responsible for his training, education <clears throat> in every way, both his education in the bookish sense, but his education on how to live and what it means to become the heir of the estate and all of these kind of things a trusted slave. <clears throat> so what Paul is going to do, you notice, and notice that, the, <clears throat> that what's going on here, of course, is the question is, who are Abraham's true children, true sons? Who are the heirs of Abraham? <clears throat> the answer is those who have put their trust in Christ Jesus. So that at the end of this present argument, in, in the end of verse 6, I mean verse 3, chapter 3, excuse me, he says, <clears throat> if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. Now he's using, uh, this is a play, of course, on the, uh, on, uh, on the promised Abraham that your seed shall be, you know, enormous in terms of, and, and it, it's, it's, Paul makes a play on the singular and plural, and Paul knows precisely what he's doing. This is not, he, he's often accused of, sort of playing the rabbi here, but he, I mean, yeah, he could play the rabbi, but I don't think that's what he's doing here. <clears throat> he recognizes, just as the Old Testament itself does, that God regularly speaks of Israel in the singular, even though it's a plural. So when, in, for, for example, in, in Exodus 4, uh, what is it, 23, 24, 22, 23, somewhere there, I should memorize those verses because they are among the more important ones in the Old Testament. Uh, God tells Moses that go tell Pharaoh. And what he's to tell Pharaoh is you let my son, my firstborn, go. Now, what's crucial about that language, my son, my firstborn, is that that's the language that is eventually going to be applied to the king. So the king becomes the son. So that in the coronation psalm, in, in, uh, <clears throat> in Psalm 2, uh, the son, who is, uh, who is Israel collectively in, in its earliest expression, is now collective Israel found singularly in its king. So, uh, so it, is the exalt, it is the exaltation of my son, who is the king who as king represents, stands in for the people as a whole. Which then in Psalm 89, 
<clears throat> is language that is going to be used of David especially. And you understand Psalm 89 is the, is the last psalm in book three. And book three is, is, is the book in the Psalter that, that struggles with the demise of the Davidic uh, kingship. Books one and two are celebrations of David as king. And particularly book two, which has all of the non-Davidic psalms at the, uh, up front that are the, the, the part of the Psalter that celebrate Zion and Jerusalem and, and, and the king. Uh, so, so that psalms, books one and two, uh, celebrate the, the, the role of the king in Israel. And in many of these psalms, David as king is, is praying or lament or praising in, in behalf of all of Israel, even though it's about him personally, he's taking, he's standing in for all of Israel. So that in book three, when, <clears throat> when uh, which is obviously a collection of psalms, some of which were written during the exile or after the exile, all of these psalms are brought together. And the last one, Psalm 89, is the one where uh, Ethan, what the, the Ezraite, uh, is the only one by him and the Psalter, uh, uh, pleads with God, where is your great love, your, your chesed and emmet now? That chesed and emmet that you promised to Moses on the mount, that your loving kindness and faithfulness, to use the King James language, which I still prefer, frankly, for those two words, uh, just where are they now? And then he, he in, 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 in letting out that anguish, he picks up the Davidic uh, uh, covenant and just pours out his soul in terms of the promises that were given to David. And in the process, David is called God's son, God's prototokos, God's firstborn. Which, of course, is what the New Testament now is going to pick up in terms of Christ being that prototokos, Colossians 1.15. He's the prototokos over all creation, the firstborn with regard. And, and you understand that that's not meaning the first one in time that is born, but the one who has the rights of pro, pro, uh, primogeniture, the one who has the rights of being the heir because he is the son who is the heir of all things. And that's the way the Old Testament understood the messianic, the king and then the messianic king. So uh, Christ is that seed. He is, what I'm pointing out is that Paul is not playing games here. He is fully within the biblical understanding of the role of the king and of the Messiah. That the seed, even though it means all of God's people, is focused primarily in the one true seed of whom we become the seed as we belong to him. So he says at the end of this passage, uh, then you are Abraham's seed, the fulfillment of that promise, which of course is Christ, but because Christ is that seed, he's argued earlier back in verses 15 and following, we now in Christ are, a, are, are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now what Paul has done at this point is to set up some new, new ideas, new, new things in the argument. It's the pedagogue who is responsible for the heir who is heir of everything but hasn't reached majority, and as long as the heir is in his minority, he has all the rights, but none of the rights. <laughs> He's the heir of everything, but he doesn't have those fulfilled rights. So that's what he picks up then in 4.1 and following. Well, once he does this, he starts a new set of metaphors going. And it's now going to be the contrast between being a slave and a son. And the way this works, so much, watch, the, watch his mind going here, uh, a mind, if you will, truly inspired of the Spirit, but you just see this mind at work. Because the, 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 the child who is the heir, who in his minority, is both son and no better than a slave. And so he doesn't, he doesn't realize being the heir until he comes into his majority at 13 or whatever, usually in, in that uh, worldview. So now we have son and slave. Well, notice that that's how the argument last night concluded. The spirit of the son 
whereby we turn to God and by the Spirit of the Son crying out from within, Abba. So Paul concludes, so you are no longer slaves. Now how does he pick up the slaves? Well, he says back in verse 3, so when you were under age, so when we were under age, uh, meaning in one's minority, when we were under age, we were in slavery. And then one of the most remarkable things in all of the Pauline letters is we were in slavery under the stoicheia of the world, whatever that word means. We finally translated it elemental spiritual forces of the world. Now, Paul is prepared to place living under law in the same category as living under the demonic powers that the Greeks and Romans lived under as they were oppressed by the powers. The gods, particularly the goddess uh, Tyche or Fortuna, uh, fate, as uh, Pliny the Elder said, <laughs> every, uh, fate rules the world. She is blessed and blamed for everything. Everything is related to the fact that it, it's fate. That's why you name your, 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 your child Eutychus or Syntyche because you want him or her to have success, good luck. You want them to have good fortune. So you, you, you bless the child by naming it in the name of the goddess who is the goddess that controls all things. You, 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 she gets blessed blessed for everything good that happens and blamed for everything bad that happens. And the whole world is under, if you will, the, the power of Fortuna. Now, you can read that in Pliny himself. This is not Gordon making something up. It's the stoicheia of the world. Now, the point is that Paul is ready to place living under law in the same category. We were enslaved in the same way that you Gentiles were enslaved, we were enslaved. And the only way out of this slavery is to have the slavery broken by the one who God sent into the world, born of woman, born under law, in order to redeem under law and bring us into this adoption as heirs of the eternal God. But what he set loose now is this slave child imagery. And that just sets all kinds of things in motion for Paul that we're going to work on for the rest of this letter. <clears throat> now, before he does that, of course, he applies the argument, verses 8 to 11. And I don't need to spend time here except to note that he said, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not God which in the next sentence he equates again with the stoicheia of the world. But now that you know God, and I, I love, Paul has these, these wonderful, powerfully precise theological instincts. There is a sense in which we know God, but that pales into the reality of the fact that God knows us. What I meant yesterday, when I said, we get, you get the subject and the predicate right. You get the, 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 the subject and the object. You know, it's not our knowing God that counts for much. It's the fact that God knows us. That's Pauline theology. It's biblical theology. Puts the emphasis on the right syllable. So he, he, he applies this, why do you wish to be enslaved all over again? And the enslavement now is to the observance of days, form of law. You are set free from slavery. Why do you want to do this all over again? You were enslaved to the stoicheia, and now you want to go into our enslavement, enslavement to the law. And somewhere here in the middle is the freedom of children who are heirs, 
who live the life of the Spirit, and you're simply wanting to go from one form of slavery to another form of slavery, and, and, and missing out the reality uh, of what God is about. Well, then after this very, very powerful appeal in verses 12 to 20, which we really don't have time to take up except uh, to note that Paul says, look, you would have been willing to dig your eyes out for my sake if you could have which probably says something about the nature of the illness that he is referring to. In any case, he, he at the end, uh, does this other remarkable thing where he takes on the role of the, of the mother in labor, uh, as if a man could know about that, really. But I suppose if you've observed it as a man, there's, there is something to be recognized of, of, of the pain, the, what's, what's involved. And uh, my body was off and said, she said, you know, if, uh, if, if the world were arranged that, <clears throat> that men and women alternated in having, giving birth, and the women were first, there would be no more than three children in any family. <laughs> That's a way of saying that we men are wimps when it comes to pain. <laughs> but in any case, Paul has some sense of, of the agony. And all you have to do is see it, be observant, and the agony. Uh, that he says, I'm, I'm in childbirth again for you. Uh, just, uh, it's an incredibly powerful metaphor. <clears throat> well, what he does then next is to pick up the slave free thing. And he does this with something that <clears throat> he tells us that he is doing this uh, as, a, as a figure. So don't, don't, don't get on his case. He's, he knows full well what he's doing. The reason for doing it is not so much because of Hagar and Sarah. What he does with Hagar and Sarah is the remarkable thing. That Hagar, the slave woman, who bears the child, the slave child, that she stands in for present-day Israel, who is still under law. And Isaac, Sarah, Isaac, stand in for those who have become followers and believers in Christ Jesus who have experienced true, free sonship. Now, that's what he's after. Now, what he does with this is nearly impossible to translate. And, and here is a place that I did... Uh, I, I, we, we, did we went through the whole round of, of uh, the whole New Testament... And then uh, the summer before, uh, two summers ago, we, we spent uh, our entire uh, time in the summer uh, reviewing everything we had done in the New Testament with, with all kinds of proposals being brought back. And I lost this proposal the first time, so I said, I'm willing to try it again. <laughs> because back in 3.3, Paul sets up an initial contrast and the Greek is kata sarka and kata pneuma. Now that's the essential contrast. Kata sarka means according to the flesh, and it's a word play because it's, it's, it's literal flesh, circumcision, but it's also the moment you go that way, you also then yield to flesh in its, in its pejorative sense of someone whose life is... is is turned inward, self-centered, becomes an existence over against God. So your options are living katasarka or katapneuma. And what he does is that the birth of these two sons, one is born katasarka, which the NIV had the, <laughs> the temerity 
to translate in the ordinary way. No, there's nothing pejorative in that at all. How can you how can you even think in the ordinary way and understand that what lies behind that is katasarka? Well, the, the committee didn't move very far, but at least it now says according to human effort, so that it at least has that semi-pejorative sense. But it's it's the one is born, and, and, and listen, it's katasarka. Sarah and Abraham decide to fulfill God's promise on their own. Katasarka. Hagar, Ishmael. That wasn't God's way. So the one who is born according to the promise, Paul says in verse 29, is born katapnuma, according to the Spirit. Well, he's obviously making a lot of theological hay out of that Old Testament narrative. On the basis, on the genuine basis of what they really did, they they chose to go katasarka in order to fulfill God's promise, and they should have waited and let it be katapnuma, a miracle of the spirit. Now that's the reason for this choice of this this marvelous contrast that he's going to set up. So notice how the argument concludes in verse twenty-six. The Jerusalem that is above is free, and she is our mother. Then, and and just don't miss the fact, Paul knows his Old Testament. He knows where these texts are. He does not not do with Old Testament texts what he's often accused of doing, taking texts out of context because they have words that he likes and he makes his point. He knows precisely where this text is in the Old Testament. Isaiah 54.1 which immediately follows what? Isaiah 52, 12 through 53, 12. Okay? The servant Messiah who has brought about this reality that that the barren woman, and this, of course, in, in Isaiah is a play on Sarah's barrenness, but now in the context of the exile, where exiled Israel is now barren again. The the suffering servant is the one who's going to bring deliverance to this exiled people. And of course, this is where Tom Wright is uh, putting a lot of his understanding and energy of the coming of Christ is that in the time of Jesus, Israel still understood itself to be an exile. And the reason is that the temple the second temple didn't have the glory of the first temple. So there's this sense that even though they were no longer in Babylonian captivity, they're still in exile, awaiting the deliverer to come. Well, Paul simply picks this up. Be glad, barren woman. You who bear no children, break forth and cry aloud, you who have no labor pains, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. More are the children of this new thing that God is going to do than all of the children of the past. And Paul knows well what this, he sees this text as being fulfilled in Christ in the Spirit. <clears throat> Playing, of course, on the desolation, the, 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 the barrenness of Sarah's womb, which, of course, is what Isaiah was doing. So now he's going to apply it. Now, you brothers and sisters, like Isaac, are children of promise. At that time, the son born Katasarka, born by human effort, persecuted the son born by the power of the Spirit. In the same way, so it is the same way now. But what does Scripture say? And you know, he's not going to let this Old Testament narrative go. Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance of the free woman's son. Now, <clears throat> the reason for this whole narrative is because in the Septuagint, Hagar is called the slave woman. That's how it's translated regularly about her in the Septuagint. She's the slave woman. And it's precisely because of that that Paul is going to make 
use of this narrative to make the contrast between being a child of the slave woman and still in bondage and children of the free woman, totally free because it's the work and power of the Spirit. So he's going to make a final application and then appeal. It is for freedom. Now you'll, you'll see that this is the new... <clears throat> This is the new focus and emphasis of the argument now. It is for freedom, not enslavement. It is for freedom. And, and you understand when I say it's not enslavement. We're still dealing with whether we're going to live under law or live by the power of the Spirit under the grace of God. So all of this is still the same thing, but the metaphor has now shifted considerably, getting at the same point. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again under a yoke of slavery. Notice that's the language, slave and free, slave and free. The free has to do with, with, with legitimate sonship, legitimate heirs. Slavery, of course, is under law. So it's either we're going to be children of God by the Spirit through, through the work of Christ by the Spirit of God, the Spirit of the Son who has come to live within and, and enables us to say Abba as evidence that we are indeed children and not slaves, children of the eternal God and not slaves. So he's going to say, so live out in freedom, not in slavery. And then he <clears throat> appeals to them, mark my words, if you let yourselves be circumcised, you bring yourself back under slavery. He, he makes this, this uh, very strong statement that, of course, has created an enormous amount of theological uh, angst, uh, which I think is, is probably just a bit unnecessary. But the fact is that I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You are trying to be justified by faith. You who are trying to be justified by faith. I'm sorry, by law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. I don't, I'm not prepared to argue that Paul is thinking about eschatological end at this point. He's simply making the flat out statement that you're no longer living under grace. You're no longer under Christ. You have abandoned Christ for law. That would have its eschatological consequences, I would assume. But the point is here is not that kind of theological discussion. It's the reality that by abandoning Christ, you go back to slavery. You've lost your relationship with grace. So what we have then in verses 5 and 6 is a kind of the culmination of so much. By faith, we eagerly await through the Spirit the righteousness for which we hope. And that is now the eschatological fulfillment of the righteousness that we've already received. So what, we, what, what, what is happening here now is that this is going to be the last emphasis on righteousness, justification as God's declaration with regard to us at the entry point. From now on, his concern is going to be the righteousness that needs to be lived out because we have been made righteous through the work of Christ. So he picks it up in verse 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. And now listen. The only thing that counts is faith. Period? No. That's a very Lutheran, Calvinistic way of reading the Bible. And it's not Paul. The only thing that counts is faith that expresses itself in love. You cannot have faith that doesn't express itself in love. Or to put it another way, if faith does not express itself in love, it's not faith. It's something else. But it's certainly not faith. Not in Paul's view. That, isn't do, that is not talking about works. That's just simply talking about trusting God, experiencing the Spirit, and then that trust works its way out in our lives, not individualistically, but in community by way of love. 
Well, then there's this final appeal. We'll, we'll let that, have to let that go. <laughs> you were running well. Uh, who cut in on you? It's a, a race metaphor. <clears throat> because <clears throat> the rest of my time, I want this to uh, wrestle with uh, what happens in verse 13 uh, to the end. Now, it is quite common when you read the literature on Galatians to, uh, to have people, with, starting with verse 5-1, to say that now the theological argument is over. Now we're at the practical application. Uh, this is sort of the ethical expression, and I did not, that simply doesn't work here. This is argumentation. In fact, in 5.13 and following, there are only two imperatives in the entire passage. This is not imperatival. It has an imperatival thrust to it. I grant you that. But it's argument. This is argument, pure and simple. Now, what he's going to pick up and what he has to pick up is what happens to righteousness thought of in terms of behavior, which is a Jewish way of understanding righteousness. That is, righteousness is a quality in God, but it, it expresses itself in God's behavior, how God acts. Righteousness that expresses itself in love. Now, what Paul is concerned with is, okay, what happens if you do away with law? What happens to righteousness? And the answer is it gets better. That's the answer. Now, how he does this is to, again, work from the Old Testament. He can't do otherwise here. So you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, picking up now freedom, slavery. <clears throat> but do not use your freedom wrongly. That is, do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature this, the, the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. A, a marvelous metaphor that really can't be translated uh, in, in, in verse 13. That uh, it, it's, it's the picture of, of the, uh, the, the, the wharf where the ship is, is set out to sea. He says, don't let, don't let your freedom be a, a place for setting out to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Now, Paul is not trying to be done with the law. He sees Christ as bringing the law to its proper fulfillment to its proper completion. And the whole law, and you understand the Jewish rabbis understood this, the whole law is fulfilled in the, in the twofold command, love God, the Shema, and love neighbor as self. The whole law, thinking now only in terms of the horizontal dimension of law, the whole law is fulfilled in this one command, one word, love neighbor as self. Now, everything that follows is going to be an explication of how the Spirit brings that about so that you don't need to come under the law. Everything. And I need to say it now, lest time get away and I forget that this argumentation is not about our one-on-one -on -one relationship with God. It includes that, but it's not about that. The moment we do that, we fall into what I call the, the, the trap of historic Protestantism, where everything has to do with individualistic salvation, where everything has to do with me and my relationship with God, so that the point... Of our, of our historic view tends to be that God's aim in salvation is to populate, populate heaven with as many individuals as he can. 
I said, no, that misses the whole biblical story by a thousand miles. God is trying to create a people who in their life together express his character. God, Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit is recreating himself in his people so that in their life together they look like this. Now, I grant you there's an individualistic element to this. There is that part of that, that place where we individually must respond. But that's not what the text is about. Now, the evidence for this is verse 15. It, it fascinates me when I read the literature that 515 doesn't exist in most people's comments on Galatians. It doesn't exist. Even such an astute scholar as Hans Dieter Betz wipes this text away just, you know, just with the back of his hand. And the reason for it is it doesn't fit his scheme. He has a scheme, and he's going to make the scheme work no matter what Paul says. <laughs> Probably all of us are guilty of that at some point. It's so much easier to see in someone else than in oneself, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to argue that this is the heart of things for Paul. Verse 15. I mean, you, you understand that... Now let me go to the board here for a minute. I tell students that the great problem with the law is that it functions like a fence. And uh, it... it its, its purpose is to keep you in the fence so that you look righteous. Yeah. Right big enough so people can see, of course. <laughs> no, a novel idea. <laughs> This is righteous, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Righteousness is going to be defined in terms of observable behavior. So that as long as one <clears throat> lives within the fence, one appears righteous. Uh, <clears throat> a perfect example is the rich young man who comes to Jesus and asks about eternal life. Keep the commandments. Don't steal. Okay? He doesn't steal, so he's righteous, right? Yeah, I mean, actually, that, yes. That's their understanding of righteousness. This young man had, obviously, some other things that he, he thought needed to be dealt with that were a bit too much for him when, he, when the answer came. But, <clears throat> but thou shalt not steal. Don't murder. So all this does is it keeps you in, in the fence so that you may appear to be righteous. But you don't have any idea whether you're really righteous or not. Until what? Until you tear the fence down. And the moment you tear the fence down, then you find out whether there's real righteousness or not. Because at issue is not whether you don't steal, but whether you love the poor, and give of your goods to care for them. That's righteousness. It's not a matter of not stealing from somebody. It's a matter of caring for somebody. It's not a matter of not murdering somebody. That's easy enough for most of us, I think. It's a matter of not gossiping about them and killing them and reputation by words that slay more than nine. So what happens is you tear down the fence, and what happens to people? Now, the only hope is to tear down the fence and have something in its place. And that's to have the cross in the middle and the Holy Spirit. Because apart from that, there is no real righteousness. I mean, apart from that, you still ask what I... The Jewish community, I, I don't mean to, but, but I'm just going to use it for a shorthand. 
you have to stop asking Jewish questions. How many times must I forgive? Now, that's an interesting idea, isn't it? I mean, you know, Peter reaches in deep into his bag. Seven? <laughs> but what happens on the eighth time? You know, when the guy's giving him the back of his hand, seven, you know, first two or three, it's easy. I forgive. I'm a good guy. I'm a Christian. I love Jesus. But the fourth time, you say, ah, I forgive you. That's four. <laughs> the next time, you say, ah, five. Yeah, you're forgiven. Five, six, seven. Go ahead. Hit me one more time. How many times is he forgiven? How many? None. Not one. Because you can't count and forgive at the same time absolutely impossible to know how many times you've forgiven and truly have forgiven. You understand? This is why it takes something besides the law if anything's going to work. Because real righteousness is something that none of us is going to be able to do because we've got a law that says do it. It's going to take the activity of the Spirit that's going to recreate us. So look at verse 15. I mean, this is clearly where the problem lies. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. Look down at verse 26. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. You have a community that wants to be religious but doesn't want to be good. A community that is prepared to be righteous without goodness. Biblical concept, you know, Romans 8. For a righteous person, someone, no one would die. But for a good person, someone might dare to die. I mean, the righteous just aren't the loved or the loving. Now, I know that Paul would use righteousness in another way, but in this case, he makes a contrast between those who live by law and have all of the right behavioral responses according to the law and the good person who recognizes that goodness goes much deeper than righteousness and has to do with caring for the other. Look at the end of our chapter. We're not going to get there. So watch. look at the end of this whole argument, verses six, chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Let us not become weary in doing good. Now, that's, that's the Greek. What is the, what is the traditional in, in well-doing or something like that? All you have to do to destroy an idea is to create a, a, a word that doesn't mean anything or that's so fuzzy it doesn't mean anything. Let us not become weary in doing good. Verse 10, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. <laughs> that's the final word, do good. Now, <clears throat> the point is that that's what, that's what true righteousness is. It is an expression of the goodness of God, for you are good, for you are good. And your mercy endures forever, for you are good. This is the Old Testament psalmist exalting God, especially in the Chronicles, when, it, when that, that's the psalm that's brought into the, to the dedication of the temple, for you are good, and your mercy endures forever, for you are good. I have to say to your friends with weeping, that the great problem that the Christian faith has in the world is that we tend to be perceived as people who are always right 
that don't have a lick of goodness. Who being religious is more important than being good. The world perceives us that way. And if that's not fair, and I tend to think it's not quite fair, the fact is that the perception is there because so much of that exists. Paul is after people biting in the dark. You understand, this is the ultimate sin. The ultimate sin is community conflict. Uh, let's pick up what the, what the text, how Paul's going to respond to. So I, Paul says, so I say, walk by the Spirit. And you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature of the flesh. Now this is promissory. It's a very strong promise. Walk by the Spirit, and you will not do this other thing. Now, the moment this is, this, we hear this in our culture, you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature, we immediately begin to turn this inward, and especially men think in terms of sexual sins of some sort. Uh, I'm sorry. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a problem, a real problem in many cases. But that's not what Paul is dealing with. He's dealing with internecine conflict in the community of faith. Now, the reason we can be sure of that, and by the way, let's do verse 17 because I have to make sure that we get this one right. Verse 17 has nothing to do with Romans 7. Nothing, nothing. What Paul says is, if you walk by the Spirit, you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. And these two ways of living are an absolute contradiction and conflict to one another. You either live one way or the other because the spirit is against the flesh. The flesh is against the spirit. He, he does that for the balance. But take that second one away and then you get to the, the why. The spirit is against the flesh so that you may not do any old thing you want. That's where that henna clause fits in. It's not because they're in conflict that you get stymied and can't figure out what to do. You know good and well what to do. At issue is that the flesh is against the spirit, but good news is the spirit is against the flesh so that you may not indulge it. That's the point of the text. Not any inner conflict that I somehow can't get out of. The conflict is between the flesh and the spirit. We're on the side of the spirit, praise God. Just nothing, nothing of, of Romans 7, which is also badly handled exegetically in many circles as well. But in this case, in this case, it's simply a wrong importation of something that's not even close to what this text is about. They are in conflict, but it's because the spirit is against the flesh that you may not do whatever you want. That's the point. But he says in response to that, if you're led by the spirit, you're not under the law. Now, what happens next is you're going to describe these two ways of living, living kata sarka, living kata pneuma. What I want you to observe is that living kata sarka, he lists 15 sins. The NIV, TNIV, has, they did a, a very nice exegetical thing. They grouped these into the clear, grouping of the four that Paul himself lists. I grant you that in the Greek text, you don't have this nice, convenient semicolon, but the semicolon needs to be there. <laughs> because here is, here is what the sinful nature is like. It's obvious, Paul says. The first three deal with sexual immorality. The second with idolatry and wishcraft. Okay? Now, those always make one and two or two and one in the list, in Paul's list because these are, the, these are the most obvious sins of Greco-Roman culture, idolatry and sexual immorality. And they go together. So you've got three sins of sexual immorality, two of idolatry, and then you get the real list. Eight of the 15 are sins of discord. Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy. 
What's that dealing with? It's dealing with verse 15. Do you understand? This is the issue. It's a church that wants to be religious but doesn't want to be truly righteous. A people that want to give unto the law so that they get by and get into heaven but don't care a thing about being reshaped into the image of the living God by bearing the image of the Son because the Spirit of the Son dwells to do that very thing. And then he concludes with another set. Now he says, I warn you, the people that do live like this are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. But what I want you to note is that eight of those 15 are sins of discord in the community. You understand, my point is that we, we tend to take a different view of what, what, what really bad sin is. The New Testament is pretty clear on this one. The really bad sin is when brother and sister are not loving one another. That becomes incidental to us as long as we're not involved in idolatry or sexual immorality. The New Testament has a different view. Because if we are not loving, the love fulfills the law. If we're not fulfilling the law, if we're not loving one another, everything else is up for grabs. Nothing else counts. Can I say that stronger? I mean, are you hearing? I think I'm dealing with Paul. If we are not being the spirit people at this point, everything else is up for grabs. What we're doing is the moment we do this, we're going to individualize our faith so that I have my one-on-one relationship with God and I feel good about myself inside and have warm fuzzies toward Jesus. I keep saying, look, you can't tell whether a person's a Christian until they rub elbows with somebody who's not like them. You can't tell whether they're Christian until I have to belong to somebody in a community of faith and rub elbows with somebody that's quite different from them. And then you find out whether the real thing is going on. Well, I say that, I, yeah, I recognize I'm saying some radical things, but you understand, it's radically New Testament. It's radically the picture that Paul is presenting in this text. So listen to the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love. This is the clear evidence that we're not dealing with warm fuzzies. This is agape. This doesn't mean have warm fuzzies towards somebody. This means care for the other person for that person's own sake. It simply means to care for this other. It means the way God is toward us, who deserve his wrath, we get his grace. It means to be gracious, to be loving. It means to constantly care for the other, constantly. My little wedding homily that I've given over many, many, many years, I say, you, I'm not going to be involved if you won't let me preach. It's all right. It's, it's brief. Colossians 3, 12 and following. I say, the first thing you have to recognize in your marriage is that you are, first of all, brother and sister in Christ before your husband and wife. And the importance of remembering that and recognizing that is that intimacy allows you sometime to treat the other in ways you wouldn't treat another brother or another sister in the church. Clothed with compassion and mercy and gentleness and kindness. If it's not happening with husband and wife, it's not going to happen anywhere else in the church. This is the first unit of Christian community. Those who don't have husband, I, I, you understand, I, I'm not excluding, but you understand that, that in this kind of way of intimate relationship, it's here that one finds whether one is truly graced by the Spirit or not. And when the times of conflict come, and they will, then it has to do with forgiveness, gentleness, kindness, caring. Now, just take that out of the intimacy of the marriage relationship and put it into the community of faith. That's the way we are to be toward one another. 
We are brother and sister in Christ. Love, joy. Joy is not a noun in Paul. It's a verb. Rejoice in the Lord. It's a community activity. Shalom doesn't mean a well-arranged heart, feeling good internally because I'm at peace. It means shalom, that we are in shalom with one another in the community. Shalom, peace, is the exact opposite of verse seven, uh, 15. Keep on biting and devouring one another. The fruit of the Spirit is shalom. See, the great problem with individualizing this text is we have to do with my own, and that absolutely distorts the point of the text, which has to do with two people who would ordinarily be at odds. Yet it has to do with Arab and Jew loving one another in Christ Jesus. It has to do, and you can name the Norwegian and Swede loving one another in Christ Jesus. It has to do with Jew and Gentile becoming one in Christ Jesus. And what that's going to mean then, and I realize my time is up, what that's going to mean then is patience. Kindness. These are the first two words that appear in, in, in the description of love in 1 Corinthians 13. Love is makrothumia. Love is, shows kindness. The one is the one that, that bears long with the other, and the second is the one that actively shows kindness to the other. Goodness. Faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. It brings us down to verse 6, just in, in concluding. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit, hoi pneumati koi. So, in, the, in the committee, I said, look, let's keep the thing in context and not suddenly act as if there's a chapter 6, verse 1. Because there is no 6, verse 1 in Paul. The context is those who are... And you, the moment you translate it spiritual, you have a small s, and then you have an elitist group. All he's talking about is the people that have the Spirit. Those who have... So we translated it that way. Those who live by the Spirit should restore that person with the Spirit's gentleness. He's just picked up one of the fruit of the Spirit. It ends up the fruit of gentleness, and then the NIV translates it gently, and I always pull out my hair on that one, but it's, again, contextually, it's, the, it's one of the evidences of the Spirit. When the other person sins, instead of, ha, 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 we're better than that, or, or doing it really the subtle way, oh, isn't it too bad about so-and-so, oh, just, you know, when it's so obvious that our feeling's so too bad about so-and-so, is a way of letting everybody else know that so-and-so has sinned. No, it's those who have the Spirit, where the Spirit's gentleness restores such a one, knowing that we're next. I mean, this is good stuff, friends, but I want to tell you something. There's not a one of us out in this room that can walk out of here and do this. This is why the Holy Spirit is the absolutely essential reality. And this is why the single imperative that controls this thing is walk in the Spirit or by the Spirit. Students always ask, well, how do you do that? I said, you know how you do that? Yeah, one step at a time. Walk. There is no other way. There's no magic. But the idea, if I'm going to walk in the Spirit or not, that's the issue. And this is what Christian life is all about. You understand, that's why the law has to go. Because the law can make us look religious. But it has no power. It has no power. And being reshaped into the image of Christ takes the power of the Holy Spirit. There is no other hope. My time is up. I'll entertain questions for 10 minutes.
And if you do, don't want it, I mean, if you really want your coffee, then don't ask any questions. <laughs> Maybe not a good time for questions. Okay. Now, we have to check out of our room, so we're going to have to leave here in a few minutes. We, I asked if I could get an extension of 11 o'clock or something. <clears throat> Go ahead. Sorry. So I'm just going back to uh, the, some of the discussion just been there before on, um, on the critique that Paul's making of salvation plus. Okay. Um, and how you might respond to the critique of being popular, but that's what we've done for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Oh, okay. <clears throat> uh, I think we sometimes are guilty. That is, we, we sometimes express ourselves so poorly, theologically, that we get ourselves trapped into these kinds of unfortunate caricatures. Uh, <clears throat> we're not talking about the Spirit. What we're talking about in the baptism of the Spirit in the Pentecostal view, which I embrace at this point for sure, is the empowering dimension of the Spirit. The Spirit comes, by the way, I do think in the New Testament is basically a package deal. Uh, I think our division of it is an accident of history, and then we've tried to sanctify an accident of history by separating. Uh, not that you can't make a distinction. That, that, you, know, you can make a distinction between, if you will, justification and sanctification, but it's a package deal in the New Testament. Sanctification isn't something that happens next. It's something that happens at the beginning and then just simply is going to be worked out. It's a metaphor for salvation in Paul. Now, our problem is that the moment you start using this second language, you have a hard time articulating it without giving the impression that it becomes a plus factor. So I just think we need to think in terms of the empowering, what we're thinking in terms. Look, I don't live this way. I cannot live this way without the empowering of the Spirit. And my problem with historic Pentecostalism is making the initial experience, the big deal. That is my biggest problem with my Pentecostal heritage. Because what happens is after the big deal wears off a little bit, then one, what happened? And the answer is that, as I read in the Pentecostal Evangel in America, way back when I was a pastor, a kid, baptism in the Holy Spirit, goal or gateway, and that has always been for me the imagery, goal or gateway. I was raised as a third generation in which the baptism of the Holy Spirit was the goal. And once you spoke in tongues, that was it. You, you made it. You, that was not even close to the original understanding of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which was an empowering for mission, an empowering to become the person of God. So by our articulation of, quote, second experience, we get ourselves involved in things that we shouldn't biblically. So I said, I, you know, yes, it, it has a starting point, but it needs a continuation. I get into trouble in my classes when I tell them, look, look at the verb Paul uses in, in 3.5, and he uses the same verb in Philippians 1.19, where he says, through your prayer and God's rich supply of the Spirit, I will know soteria. Well, the moment I use this rich supply, the God's giving rich supply, there are these traditional Protestants who just can't let imagery alone. They have to make it walk on all fours. I say, don't forget imagery. Just think in terms of that your, your life needs constantly to have God's supply of the Holy Spirit. We're not talking about new experiences. We're just talking about this constant supply of the Spirit. Pentecostals tend to be weak at that point because of our emphasis. Other questions? Mr. Holland, you gave some good clues, I think, today regarding the 
maintain down, um, you know, build a little bit of soup up the sink. But when it other hits the road, we tend to, I tend to make rules for myself, you know, to try to pursue this line as well. I better be careful of this or I won't watch that kind of a movie or I'll not get those I don't watch. But <laughs> I try to put rules on myself, but I find myself being, I feel as though I'm falling back into a rules. Okay, I think it's I think it's a constant battle. And living by law is so much easier. Uh, that that you, you just you, it's a, it, you build a build a good set of laws, and then you don't have to worry about the, you know. <clears throat> so I think this is a daily thing. But there is something to be recognized as your own personal weaknesses. And all of us have them. Come on, friends. And they may not all be the same. <laughs> At that point, there is a place to put a guard around oneself. I uh, long airplane trips that put me physically and mentally out of touch with who I really ordinarily am tends to give me a short fuse with people that aren't doing it my way. <laughs> There comes a moment we have to recognize the reality there and, and, and set a watch over one's mouth. I mean, that, that's not law. That's recognizing that it's difficult to walk in the spirit when you're so dead tired. You're not sure you can take the next step. So I always tell students when they come to me with these kind of things, I said, Let me, did you get a good sleep last night? How are you sleeping? And they don't think this is very spiritual. I said, look, you come back to see me tomorrow. You go get a good eight to 10 hour sleep tonight. And then you come back and talk with me. And then we'll talk about your spiritual life. It works every time. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Because what happens is they feel this depth of whatever because they're so tired. They haven't slept for so long. And sleep is God's greatest gift toward spirituality. Even while Gordon is talking, it's okay. <laughs> All right, let's have a donut or whatever it is that they've got back there for you.